Well, thank you all for being here today. And also, well, thanks to the entire EG organization for asking me to come today. It's a real pleasure and an honor being in front of all you guys. So, uh, like Martin said, my name is Charlie Bedrosian. I'm originally French, so I do apologize if you do not understand everything I say. English is not my mother tongue, but I will definitely do everything I can to be sure <laughs> you understand me. So, as Martin said, I've actually started working for the Sensi Seeds Bank, which is one of the very first seed company that actually was created in 1985. Let's be honest, I was born one year before, so I was not part of the creation of the company. But uh, I started actually as a volunteer in the Cannabis College, which is a free information center in Amsterdam about all cannabis-related questions. And basically our goal is just to provide more information, actually to fight all the misinformation that have been said in the last couple of decades. Um, the Cannabis College opened in 1998 actually as a non-profit organization in the middle of Amsterdam. And basically, like Martin was explaining a little bit earlier, we try to be as complete as we can concerning industrial users of the hemp plant or medical recreational users. Uh, we've been having the pleasure of having lots of different speakers from all around the world. And people can also come actually check our library, as you can see. We are not, of course, a proper college, properly speaking. We do not give classes or tuitions, but anyone who wants to come and learn about the cannabis plant is more than welcome to come through our doors and ask us any question. Um, you might have actually maybe seen us, actually, in an episode of a Trailer Park Boys, in another episode of Basketball Wives, or we've been also in much more serious Canadian TV shows, for example, showing uh, how to do thin layer chromatography testing. Uh, I would like just to take a couple of seconds to introduce you all, actually my wonderful colleagues, the team of the Cabis College, that actually is responsible of helping actually all the visitors to come and help us. Like the video will be on YouTube. Actually, I take the occasion to salute them. Sorry, guys, someone had to hold the fort. Actually, the pride actually, of the Cannabis College is the small garden we have in our basement. Uh, this garden is actually kind of exceptional because growing indoor in the Netherlands, contrary to what most of people think, is actually forbidden. We had... Um, specific authorization from the city hall, just for educational purposes, to be allowed to have actually five plants indoor to be shown to the public. Our garden, actually this is the old garden we used to have, and through the years we've of course tried to make things more professional and a little bit better looking. Actually, the garden of the Cabbies College, the way it looks like. So we have four different rooms with different systems of lighting. Um, most of those rooms are one meter fifty by one meter fifty. We have one veg room and several flowering rooms. So once again, I would like to remind that this is a legal growing operation. So, you know, actually all those flowers unfortunately have to be destroyed at the end of a flowering cycle. We're not allowed to use them, to give them, or to sell them, obviously. Um, yes. So, just finish the quick video here. So, we actually started not as the Cabis College, but actually as the Green Prisoner Release. It was actually a group that was militating actually to help a couple from the US called Les and Cheryl Mooring. Um, Les got caught in the United States growing cannabis for the second time, but for being in possession of a firearm, he was facing 35 years sentence. Um, with his wife, they fled to the Netherlands, but unfortunately, even if a green prisoner release tried to do their best to avoid their extradition, they eventually have been extradited to the United States. So to avoid these kind of situations again, um, they decided to create this free information center, which is the Cabis College, so actually people could get educated about the cannabis plant properly. Well, now we got to talk quickly about what's going on in the Netherlands and 
actually, we have a pretty unique drug policy. Since 1976, the Hedov actually tolerates personal use, recreational use, and any adult over 18 years old can buy five grams at the time in a coffee shop. Uh, you are allowed to have, it's not allowed, but it's tolerated to have five plants per house, only growing outdoors. Now, this is a little bit complicated because if you live, for example, in a social house, a house given by the Dutch government, this is completely forbidden. If you get caught actually growing cannabis in a social house, you will lose all your social rights, not just for housing, but actually also for your kids' education and so on. Um, only licensed coffee shops actually are allowed to sell cannabis. Um, they're not allowed to have any concentrates like actually it is very popular in the US, for a very simple reason, making concentrates is actually considered a class one substance. Making cannabis concentrate is exactly the same thing than cooking methamphetamine in your kitchen. You are making a hard drug. Um, commercial growing is not allowed. Coffee shops are allowed to have 500 grams of cannabis inside their premises to sell, but they're not allowed to buy it. They're not allowed to grow it. It has to appear by magic inside the coffee shop. So you understand, this politic was voted in 1976. In 2017, the Dutch government finally realized that maybe it would be a good idea to give some people licenses to grow for coffee shops. It took over 41 years to realize something was wrong. That was a couple of years ago, those licenses have still not been given, of course, to growers, and black market keeps on thriving. Let's be realistic, the little hash fairy still doesn't come to the coffee shops to bring you nice quality weed or nice quality hashish. It still does not work like this. Um, how did everything start? In the 60s, well, we had in Europe lots of hashish coming from Lebanon, from Afghanistan, and actually the Netherlands having two big ports, being Amsterdam and Rotterdam, of course, lots of this hashish was arriving actually to the Netherlands. Um, the very first coffee shops of the time started. There were not really coffee shops. You had a friend actually who could get you a very big quantity of hashish. A nice basement with a couple of pillows on the floor. Yeah, here we go. Let's have a coffee shop. A um, couple of years later, in the 70s, Actually, Mr. Uh, Van Hart, which was actually uh, the Minister of Justice of the time, asked for a social research about cannabis users. Also, at the time, we had a pretty big heroin crisis in the Netherlands. And actually, we started thinking, hmm, what's going on? What do we do? So we actually decided, the Netherlands, Dutch government decided to actually really fight heroin use, to actually help heroin users to get um, substitution treatments, really work out on the heroin dealers. And at the end, what's going on with cannabis? Well, cannabis smokers are not really socially dangerous, so we're going to tolerate, actually, cannabis use. This is the reason why it's never been legalized. In the 80s, we started having the first licenses for the coffee shops. So the very first coffee shops who had licenses, we had the Mellow Yellow, for example. Uh, we had the Bulldog, which is pretty famous. Uh, in uh, Utrecht, we had actually Sarasvani, which does not exist anymore, but those were the first coffee shops having an official license from the government to legally sell cannabis. In the 90s, we actually started having very stricter rules, which actually concern those different details. So you're not allowed to advertise if you have a coffee shop, no little cannabis leaf on the window to say what you're selling. You are not allowed to have any hard drugs as well. Um, the reasons actually for the neighborhood until one o'clock in the morning maximum, uh, youth, under 18 years old, you're not allowed to get any cannabis, and actually grams, it is five grams maximum per person per day, and 500 grams, like we're saying, totally in the premises. In the 2000s, well, instead of actually trying to sort some things out, and under pressure, actually, of European governments, the laws became a little bit more strict. Uh, Actually, Mr. Uh, Ivo Obstelton, which was the prime minister of the time, um, wanted to actually have what we called the wheat pass. Uh, the wheat pass was basically a measure to actually forbid 
visitors and tourists to access coffee shops and have access to cannabis, only residents or Dutch citizens could be allowed to. In Amsterdam, the mayor straight told the government it was not going to happen for a very simple reason. Economically speaking, it would have killed our town. Because, let's be honest, most of the tourists that are coming to Amsterdam, well, are not coming only for coffee shops, but partly as well. The moment we would forbid them to access coffee shops, we would actually kill a very big part of the economy. And like we were saying before, cannabis is not legal, but the government gets about 50% taxes on every gram that is sold in a coffee shop, which is actually pretty interesting. Now, that was actually what was going on. Oh, my bad, I went a little bit too bad. And so, instead of having actually the VIT pass going on in Amsterdam, we had actually an old law that was not applied, which is the 250 meter rule. You are not allowed to have a coffee shop less than 250 meters from any educational place. So it can be a kindergarten, high school, university, hairdresser, education, salon. It doesn't really matter. As long as you have actually youth and education, no coffee shop 250 meters away. Now, the Netherlands is a small, teeny, tiny country. We are basically just four times bigger than the city of Melbourne. So you can actually imagine, in a city like Amsterdam, finding a place 250 meters further than a school or an education place becomes harder and harder. Uh, for this reason, lots of coffee shops have been closing in the last years, we went from 239 coffee shops to 169. So this is roughly the situation in the Netherlands. As you can see, well, if you're a cannabis recreational user, it's pretty fun, but in the other hand, nothing is really legal. We're going to have a quick overview of what's going on in Europe. Uh, if we go, for example, in Spain, in Spain we have cannabis social clubs. The idea is actually really good. Lots of different people will unite together, actually, grow cannabis for very common use and share it between the members. Now there is a small issue is that according to Spanish law, I can technically go to a cannabis social club, buy some cannabis, so far no problem, but if I go out in the street and the police search me, well, possession of cannabis is a 300 euro fine. If you have, for example, a used grinder in your pocket, that's an extra 300 euro fine, and so on and so on. So you imagine uh, in Spain at the moment, monthly salary is about 900 euros a month. So if you get actually a fine that accumulates like this, they can literally take your monthly salary just in fines. So of course, it is not as nice to be a user, even if we have kind of a tolerate system. Uh, if we go in different European countries, we can go to Austria, where the system is even more hypocrite. We can actually buy clones in Austria. You can go actually to a shop and, oh yes, I would like to buy some clones of Super Skunk, of Silver Haze, or whatsoever. There's a catch. You can grow as many plants as you want, as long as you don't flower them. <laughs> There's a small problem here, you don't think? But just in front of the cloth shop, you have a grow shop where you can get grow tent, equipment, and flowering nutrients. <clears throat> So, you can see, absolutely no system is perfect, but unfortunately, it's the only ones we have. We're gonna have actually a very, very quick overview of what's going on in Amsterdam, because of course, yeah, we have actually lots of cannabis available in coffee shop, but quality of cannabis, like actually growing, is not controlled at all, is definitely not the nicest. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures we took with our microscopes in the Cannabis College, and it can be a little bit scary. So we will have all different kinds of pests. In this case, for example, spider mites, Yummy. So if you're vegan and thinking about making a space cake, you might have a little bit of extra protein. <laughs> so spider mites is a very, very common and frequent actually predator of the cannabis plant. Uh, we will have actually other little bugs, actually here and there, little flies, and also sometimes chemical substances that we are not really sure of. Um, actually, you can see those two pictures actually on the left-hand side. Um, what you see actually is a cannabis concentrate known as BHO, butane hash oil, that has been added to the flowers just to 
actually give the user the impression is a little bit more powerful than it really is. Um, the pink substance you're seeing actually on the picture behind me, uh, we have been actually sending this sample for testing because to be honest, just by the eye, nobody was capable of telling us what it could be. So those are actually small contaminants. We're gonna have also lots of mold, fungus. Uh, you will see here, for example, a beautiful example of power dream yield you're developing. And all those samples have been literally bought in coffee shops in Amsterdam, brought to us, and we just took pictures live on the moment when visitors were asking us to check it out. So let's put it like this. If you're a recreational user, you're in good health, and if one time you've used actually cannabis that was not of the best quality, you will not have most probably a big health issue. If you're a medical user, that becomes a problem. You could definitely send someone to the hospital just actually providing them this quality of flowers when it's supposed to be used as medicine. We could argue that this happens only in a system like ours because of course there is no control or anything. Um, but even in the legal system, these issues happen. If we look what's going on in Canada, for example, on the legal market, all those flowers have been actually photographed by users, and unfortunately, this is the quality that they have been having. Uh, mold is present, power dream mildew, and you can see an entire greenhouse that actually just went to the garbage, 200,000 plants, completely contaminated and had actually to go. This is one of the reasons why actually Canada has the issue at the moment of being capable of providing enough cannabis for its users. We can go also quickly. In the US, I'm going to take, uh, sorry, that, the Californian example. Well, California decided to legalize the use of cannabis after several US states did, like Colorado and Washington before. In the state of Colorado, we had actually a very mm, impressive tax raise and cannabis industry has been booming. So the Californian state thought, yeah, we're gonna make just as much money out of it. What's going on is that basically the license system uh, is actually really expensive for the growers and most of Californian growers decided not to have a license, they just keep on working on the black market. Um, nowadays, we even find Californian flowers in Amsterdam that are sold exactly the same price than a gram of gold, between 25 up to 40 euros a gram. This is a little overview of what's going on, but what is going on actually with the first world's producer? Well, the first world producer of cannabis doesn't have much money or doesn't have actually much agricultural knowledge. But if we take a look in what's going on in the Moroccan mountains, we have thousands, for not saying millions, of plants growing, and Morocco is nowadays the first producer of cannabis in the world, and we estimate about 40% of the world's cannabis are produced in those mountains. Um, will be mostly done under the form of hashish, not wait for a very simple reason. Well, it's way much more easy to transport and smuggle from one country to another. This is the reason why Europeans we will have way much more hashish than actually weed. Um, weed arrive very, very late, and people are still not actually really comfortable with it. So that's actually a very quick overview of what is going on here and there. And just actually to go back a little bit more interesting subject, we're going to start talking about growing. <laughs> well, when we want to grow, we actually have basically three factors for having a successful crop. First of all, the environment, actually, which means the environment our plants are going to grow in. Second of all, actually, nutrition, well, watering, and then genetics. So a couple of examples of indoor grow setups, of course, grow cabinets or grow tents. Roughly, if you want to have an entire room in your house, it works basically the same. Or greenhouses, like actually we have here. Um, so you see actually this picture on, the, uh, on your right-hand side. This is not a cannabis growing crop. 
so you actually understand it's a huge actually greenhouse system that actually we have in the Netherlands because everything grows in a greenhouse, even our tomatoes and strawberries. You can also actually see we have the greenhouses of GW Pharmaceutical and other greenhouses here and there. How come I'm talking about indoor growing and greenhouse growing and not about outdoor growing? Well, if we want to have actually a certain standard in quality, like we were saying a little bit earlier, we want to control our environment. And well, in some countries, like Morocco for example, we have actually great conditions outdoor. In some others, not really necessarily. And unfortunately, you cannot control the weather. That would be amazing, but it still does not work. If you can, please give me the trick. <laughs> so yeah, our environment, basically we have five factors that we want to control. This is actually only concerning indoor growing. The last detail, if you work in a greenhouse, is not really relevant, but we're gonna see that in a couple of seconds. So first of all, temperatures. Well, <clears throat> cannabis actually develops better in actually, well, moderate temperatures. Lots of people tend to think it's a tropical plant, but actually the best results are actually obtained around 24 Celsius degrees. We try actually to avoid, like you're saying, between day and night temperatures to have actually a too wide difference. Just because, like we were explaining earlier, this is actually a very good cause, for example, for powdery mildew or some kind of fungus to develop. Humidity levels. Well, it's pretty simple. Well, the numbers you'll see behind me are just an indication. Realistically speaking, depending on the phases and the stages of our plant, we will need different humidity levels. So for example, during our growing vegetative stage, we will like to have actually a pretty high humidity level because the plants need so. While we're gonna go flowering, we will slightly decrease our humidity just to avoid, once again, mold, mildew, and other kind. In the other hand, if you go too dry, under 40% of humidity, you are giving actually spider mites the perfect environment to develop. Air circulation, airflow, it actually seems pretty normal, but yes, actually plants will need a minimum of airflow just for a simple reason. That will help them, number one, actually to get a stronger stem, but also to actually help photosynthesis to make it actually very, very quick. Um, imagine this is the leaf of your plant. You will have CO2 stagnating all around. Well, the fact of having this CO2 moving around the plant helps the plant absorb it for its photosynthesis. If it will be just stagnating there, it would not be actually as nice. Also, what we need, want is to avoid damp, hot, and so on. So air circulation definitely is a must, and let's be honest, you'd never have enough fans in a grow room. As many fans as you can put, the best. Um, then we have actually, of course, intake and outtake. This is a mistake. This is very, very frequently done. I have actually a certain size of room, but for saving a little bit of money, we're gonna try to get a little bit cheaper, smaller fan. That's the thing. The power of intake and outtake depends also on the volume, actually, of a room you'll be growing in. It's just as simple as that, it's a simple rule of thumb, but it's something actually lots of people tend to forget about. Well, after we have lights. Well, we've been using lots of different lights within the years. Uh, for growing indoor, we first use actually high intensity discharge lamps, such as methyl highlight or high pressure sodium. Since a couple of years, the LED industry is slowly, slowly actually catching up and becoming more and more popular. And of course, you can use actually solar power. If you're in a greenhouse, definitely the best will be to combine both to use actually natural sunlight and complete it with artificial light whenever necessary. So reflection is pretty simple, but the light actually needs to be reflected. So if you're growing indoor, or in a grow tent, we will actually like the light to reflect as much as possible so the plants can actually benefit from it as much as possible. In a greenhouse, obviously, that does not really apply because if you try to put reflective material all around your greenhouse, the light will not come in. It goes a little bit against the purpose of the whole thing. Well, in what concerns nutrients, those are the very basic nutrients we actually gonna need. 
what we could call primary nutrients. In secondary nutrients will be, actually we have calcium, magnesium, uh, copper, manganese, iron, zinc. They're not that necessary. Always remember, it's easier, very, very easy, to overfeed plants using fertilizers. I have been asked, I think, this question over 2,000 times. What is the best fertilizer? What works for you? But <clears throat> just actually be moderate on your uses of fertilizers. It's always better to give not enough and give too much a little bit later than giving too much and having to flush your entire medium or just throw your plants to the garbage. So during our vegetative stage, we're going to use mostly nitrogen. No, sorry about that. A little bit low. Well, like for example, we're growing indoor. We would like to have 18 hours of light, six hours of darkness, and we will mostly use nitrogen. Um, in the, our case, for example, we can grow plants for over 10 weeks without using fertilizer a single time, just because we're going to very very frequently repot those plants in containers, always of a double of size. The fact of bringing fresh soil and fresh nutrients actually helps us not needing to add extra fertilizers all the time. For flowering, we will mostly use, well, phosphorus and potassium. And uh, we have our 12 to our cycle, actually just to make things going down. But very, very basic growing. So you can see an example of plants growing. This is a plant we've been growing in the Cannabis College not long ago. Um, you can see me actually in one of the rooms. I barely fit inside the room. That plant has been only growing for 10 weeks. The room is 1 meter 50 by 1 meter 50, so you can realize roughly what it looks like. And once actually you arrive to our flowering, well, we've been literally using very, very few, actually, phosphorus and potassium just to help the plant develop a little bit and give actually the results you can see there. Most common mistakes actually are not done while growing, but actually once growing is done. Most growers will take really good care of the plants while they're growing and flowering, and at the end of the flowering, they will actually miss the last third of the job, which is drying, harvesting, and curing. Well, harvesting, most of the time, people tend to be impatient and harvest a little bit too soon. Uh, it's actually really hard to wait for some stoners, but it's the way it is. Things take time, and you need to be patient. <laughs> drying. Drying, well, um, how to we dry? Should I take my leaves off? Should I leave them on? That depends on the humidity levels around you. For example, if you are drying in a very humid environment, you will like to take as many leaves off from your plant just to be sure you will not have actually any mold issues or whatsoever. If it's a very dry environment, you don't want your plants to dry too fast, so we will leave actually the leaves to be sure or our chlorophyll transforms in sugar. Curing, yeah, well, once our plants have been dry properly, well, we still need actually those flowers to develop aromas and actually for all the molecules, actually, uh, sorry, my bad. Uh, we need sometimes for, like I was saying, chlorophyll to transform in sugars, which actually allow the flowers to develop their smells. This is a very, very common mistake, but if you have more questions, more specific, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So, basically, this is what we do. Trying to educate the industry of today and tomorrow because, well, we have actually a legal market that actually starts growing, but actually this legal market, unfortunately, does not necessarily know what they do. Uh, we've seen it, for example, in Canada, in the US, and, for example, in lots of places where legal cannabis actually starts to be available. Well, most of the people taking care, actually, of the cannabis plants in this industry are not necessarily experienced. We have lots of people that actually are experienced, but unfortunately, like they are illegal outlaw growers, they will not be included, actually, in this, which is a very big mistake. So what do we need? It's actually pretty simple. From our seed, our clone, to the final user, we will have growers, trimmers, 
packagers, resellers. And basically educating all those people is what actually is going to help us reach higher standards for actually tomorrow's quality in the industry. So I finished actually five minutes earlier than expected, which I think will give you five extra minutes for all the questions you could have. What's your optimal figure for volumes of air circulation per hour in a fully enclosed environment? Uh, me, honestly, I like actually one cubic meter per hour per watt of light. Okay. But this is actually the way I work. After, if not, actually the easiest way is actually just to calculate the volume of the room you're working in. And you will like actually all the volume of the room taken out in about an hour. So let's say you have a 300 cubic meters uh, room, you will like to have 300 cubic meter an hour, for example, and so on. Thank you. You're um, welcome. I was, I was told um, for a general glass house purposes it was five volumes of air an hour. Sorry? I was told that for general glass house purposes it was necessary to have five volumes of air an hour, which really changes conditions for temperature because you do require... Mm. Also, we have to pay attention to one thing. Uh, depending on the outside conditions, it can depend. Um, let's put a very simple example. Between here in Melbourne, outside at the moment, it's pretty cold and humid. Or if you're growing in the south of Spain where it's 45 degrees Celsius, obviously uh, intake and outtake should be regulated according actually to those conditions. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Um, I heard that you should harvest your cannabis plant in the morning before light hits it so that the sugars are hiding in the roots and they're not all getting up in the flowers. Is there any truth to that? And that actually is a pretty unpopular urban legend <laughs> that has been going on around. Um, no, actually the fact of harvesting in the evening or in the morning does not really influence actually on the sugar levels. Uh, in the other hand, what can actually have an influence actually on the drying is actually if, are you harvesting with your medium wet or dry. Um, the drier the medium, the less water in the plant and the faster it will go. If you actually harvest just after watering, plants will be full of water and of course will take more time. Um, after. The sugar it's, uh, sugar's level itself will depend on the maturation level and of course after it's also genetics. From one strain to another we have different cannabinoids, we have different flavonoids and of course uh, different actually sugar levels. Cool, right on, thanks. You're welcome. Can you, um, can you tell us about current um, <coughs> excuse me, breeding programs? Um, what, the, what the state of the art is at the moment because I assume there's been decades of, of sort of work done on breeding. Yeah, okay. Well, in what concerns breeding, it's more actually my second activity actually in the Sensi Seeds Bank and not really actually for the Cabbies College. Uh, well, breeding is actually a fascinating, definitely, field. I think it was Ed Rosenthal who said, well, cannabis is not addictive, but growing it definitely is. And I can tell you one thing, if you start breeding, it becomes obsessive. Um, now we have different schools of breeding. We have actually old school breeding and breeders who have been there actually for a pretty long time. Uh, what we used to do, for example, in the beginning of a breeding history in the 80s, we had big greenhouses of 10,000 square meters. We will put 10,000 plants in there. We will select 50 only for reproduction at the end. The thing is that this actually big mass selection, well, it takes space, it takes time. It's a little bit complicated. The fact that also slowly, slowly the laws in the Netherlands became a little bit more harsh concerning cannabis growing, well, we had actually to move from greenhouses more to actually indoor production. And this is a small issue because, if, for example, most of those plants have been bred for indoor environments. So if you change them from environment, of course, they might react differently. That's one way of seeing things. Uh, you have actually a more new tendency, which is basically I will buy, I will get on the market a specific clone of what we call an elite cut. Another one, use a chemical like silver tile sulfate, colloidal silver, uh, actually force one of the plants to produce male organ and actually cross them together, have a new strain, give me $120 for 10 seeds. That's the thing. Uh, we have more serious and less serious breeders, but just like in any other activity uh, which is not cannabis related, I would say. 
And you mentioned the move from greenhouse to outdoor. So has that had an impact on selection for disease? I mean, is there much variation in disease well, resistance? From greenhouse to outdoor, not really, but from indoor to outdoor, yes, we can actually have a pretty big difference. Just for a reason, like I was explaining earlier, outdoor we have absolutely no control on the elements. So obviously, trains that were specifically bred for indoor growing don't necessarily actually will develop anywhere in the world outdoor. If you have nice weather conditions, they can do just great. Most of the time, strains that were bred specifically for indoor growing might actually have a couple issues with humidity levels, high temperatures, or the quality of the soil that is offered. Um, for breeding, what we'll try to do is actually Contrary to actually normal growing, we want to give actually our plants the harshest conditions ever. Um, this way, actually, the ones will actually resist to almost all the bad treatments we get, get them actually are the ones we would like to reproduce. Hi. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry where they grow cannabis for profit, they genetically tag the plant. So if they get stolen, they know that it's a pharmaceutical plant or where they got it from. Do you know how they genetically tag the plants and all that? So, um, yes, uh, at the moment, I think it's Rob Connor clark and uh, if I'm not wrong, the University of Columbia, but I could be wrong on this, I need to double check. Uh, you have actually, at the moment, a DNA ba um, database that is being created from the different available strays on the market. And now I'm not sure if this database is available for the public yet or not. <laughs> In your experience when training plants, is it better to do high stress with like cutting and fimming or is it for low intensity stress like bending and pinching? Now, personally, I prefer low stress training, but that's a matter of personal opinion. I'm pretty sure you ask actually 50 different growers, you will get between 25 and 50 different answers. Um, also, yeah, genetically speaking, I've noticed some strains will react better, for example, to low stress training, scrogging. Some other actually will actually react really good to topping, some not. But again, this is really more actually strain by strain dependent. Just like nutrients, some strains will like lots of nutrients, some don't like to be overfed. That's more actually a strain related question. Thank you. You're welcome. I get some thoughts on the difference in highs dependent on THC and CBD ratios. Well, not only because if we take only THC and CBD, we are taking only two compounds over 450, and we still are discovering actually some of them recently. Uh, for example, THC actually is synthesized from THCA and will degrade in CBN. Actually, THC is mostly actually psychoactive, CBN will have actually a more actually narcotic effect, for example. So even a very st sativa strain, which is supposed to be hyperactive, if it's been actually left actually a little bit too long before harvest, if it's been cured a little bit too long because yeah, the oxygen in the air actually provokes actually an oxidation of your actually trichomes, THC will slowly, slowly degrade into CBN. Thank you. You're welcome. So do you get the impression that other that growing conditions can actually influence other cannabinoid yeah, well, components? It's pretty simple. You know, um, definitely, well. um, in my opinion, uh, the better, as soon as we give actually the best conditions, the optimum conditions to our plant, we also are giving them the optimum conditions to develop cannabinoids. Uh, we see this, for example, when actually we work in breeding, the fact of pollinating actually a female, well our females will actually stop producing cannabinoids to spend more energy producing seeds, for example. Mm. This is definitely something to work out. And you can, for example, well, not only environment, but nutrition as well. You can have, to make, for example, the best quality genetics, you can have the best environment ever, but if your plant is starving, yeah, it will most probably die. Mm. Just like if you have a really high, let's say, uh, pedigree dog, yeah, it can be amazing, but if you never feed him, yeah, poor thing is not going to grow and develop the way he's supposed to. Um, with harvesting, there's lots of debates about um, the colour of the trichomes before you actually cut the flower. Mm -hmm. um, the, the general rule of thumb seems to be 30 to 40% amber before you actually 
So That's my question lot. is to you, yeah, what, what do you suggest and would you look at the sugar leaves or the calyx, calyxes, to, calyxes to tell <clears> when it's well, ready? Yeah, we'll look definitely at the calyxes, at the flower itself, yeah. better than the leaves. That's a better actually indicator. Yeah. And uh, yeah, 40% amber is way too late. Yeah. Um, we will consider that the THC peak is around 90% cloudy. Yeah about still 5% clear and 5% amber, roughly. We will be at really the peak of THC. The more amber your trichomes are, actually, Degrades. the more your THC has already degraded yeah. in CBN. Yeah, okay, lovely, thank you. You're welcome. Is there a biodynamic movement in, is there a biodynamic Demeter movement in, uh, in cannabis production at all? So, <clears throat> now, well, to be honest, that is not actually a question I was expecting. Uh, biodynamics, well, most probably, yeah. But after all, that's uh, not what I'm focusing on. No, no, understood. I guess, interestingly enough, it could coincide with the, the interests of a number of people in the, in the room or, you know, more broadly, given that there's a move beyond commercial uh, cultivation with, with synthetic... Uh, fertilizers and so on into mm -hmm. organics and then beyond to, to really respect the plant that much further. Yeah, yeah, definitely. After that's also a personal choice from the growers. Um, us, in our case, in the Cabis College, we don't use any chemical fertilizers. We actually tend to go really much more simple than that. Uh, also, for a thing is that we have to take care of all the visitors who are coming, so we cannot spend eight hours a day taking care of five plants. Yeah. So, of course, we need to make things way much more simple. This is why, for example, for growing, we will, uh, in the, our vegetative state, we actually just repot our plants very frequently. Uh, the only kind of booster we will give for our root system will be a mix of uh, mycorrhizias and trichodermas, for example. Uh, bad guano is what we will use actually for phosphorus and potassium, actually while we're flowering. But this is roughly everything we use. We don't use many chemicals. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I haven't understood the end. Um, you mean hybridised? Yep. Crossbred, you mean? Yeah, yeah, put grafted a high CBD hemp plant with a high THC cannabis plant. Mm. Oh, yeah, definitely. You, you can. Have? Um, not long ago, actually, they had this problem in Spain. Uh, an industrial hemp feed actually was pollinated by a Moroccan field 250 kilometres away. And so then what happened? Well, the entire seed production went to the garbage because the Spanish government will not allow high THC Bloody levels Spaniards. developing on Spanish soil. Spaniards! <laughs> but no, no, yeah, pollen actually can fly from pretty far distance. Uh, the moment your male flower will open, pollen can survive up to 72 hours. If you have strong weight, it can travel pretty far away. Um, pollinating actually crosses between industrial hemp and actually recreational cannabis is completely possible. Grafting works as well. Um, I've actually also heard of people trying attempts of grafting cannabis on hops and vice versa, being the two plants being the only plants of the Cannabisia family. Um, not with much success, but it does actually kind of work, but it doesn't give you hops with THC. It's easy just to brew, brew with cannabis, probably. Um, okay, I think that probably wraps it up, so I'd like to, like you do, uh, join me in thanking Charlie for a great and fascinating talk. Well, no, well, thank you guys for receiving me. It was a pleasure. And if you have any more questions, I'll be available around.